Chapter Twenty of From Baker to Beulah by Jenny Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Two: Return to Philadelphia. After spending several days in Jersey City, attending a meeting held by Rev. J. R. Irvin and wife, I went to Philadelphia to my sister's. Saturday, P.M., December 14, 1878. Count the mercies, count the mercies, number all the gifts of love. Keep a daily faithful record of the comforts from above. Look at all the lovely green spots in life's weary desert way. Think how many cooling fountains cheer our fainting hearts each day. I trust my seeing those sad hearts today was not in vain. As Sister James said when she wrote those lines, it brings us lovely green spots and cheers our hearts when we can help others. Mary Chatham came for me. We called on Sister Dunbar. From there to the store of G. Brothers, then to the hospital. Everything seems natural about my old room. Called on Dr. Morgan and returned to Mary's home. Each of these places is freighted with memories of past associations with these kind friends that time will not obliterate. Dr. M. has not charged me a dollar for all his services. I long to pay him something. Yesterday, after many calls, we attended the Friday Holiness Meetings at 1018 Arch Street, led by Rev. William Gray and Rev. Levy. For years I have been reading of these meetings. It was a soul feast. Today I called on Miss Leeds, Mrs. Hart, and Mrs. Dodderer. Dined with the latter. Met Dr. Gestler. He seemed astonished to see such a change in me. How glad I am to get back to our room. It is a blessed retreat. It is a real luxury to have a little while alone to rest and gather strength in the Lord. Many invitations are coming to attend meetings. I cannot accept all. Have made engagements for every night next week. Our dear friend Stokes came with a treat, as she always does. Tuesday, 24th December. Last Saturday morning, Mary C. and myself went to Frankfurt. We were obliged to return in a terrible snowstorm, though we rode in a streetcar part of the way. Brother A. Flintcraft called for me in the afternoon, and as the day was so stormy, I felt much inclined to stay at home, but it was a question of duty, and I decided to go with him and fill my engagement at Chester, Pennsylvania. Sabbath, at 10 a.m., I attended friends' meeting. In the afternoon, a number came to Brother F.'s, had a profitable time, yet I longed to be alone with him who knew my utter helplessness. After tea, Rev. Robinson of the M.E. Church came in. I asked him, What of the evening? He answered, We expect you to occupy it. I said, You must not depend upon me. I feel like an empty vessel unless a message is given me for the evening. As we walked to the church, he said, I am confident the Lord led you here. We shall have his presence tonight. When before the congregation, I felt more than ever my entire emptiness. I could not realize what the Lord would have me do until during Brother F.'s prayer. Then, oh, how the light broke in! I lost sight of all else but the immortal souls before me. I had liberty. At the close, the very ones that I most feared were the first to greet me. Colonel Theodore Hyatt, president of the military academy, would have me go home with his party. We talked to a late hour and had earnest prayer. They proved friends indeed. As I came into the academy, I thought, how many boys come here who have anxious mothers at home? This morning I attended the friends' meeting again. As I took my seat, I remembered that two years ago, this same hour, I was carried on my cot into the friends' meeting at Chester, Indiana. 
This afternoon I returned to Philadelphia, went with Brother F. to Mrs. Keene's, another meeting I had often read about. I cannot realize that Christmas is so near. We will spend the day with Brother H. G. It is sad to be, as a family, separated at Christmas, yet what cause for thanksgiving we have. January 1, 1879. A new year has dawned upon us, bringing its opportunities. We had a solemn watch meeting at Mount Pleasant Avenue M.E. Church, Rev. A. F. Dodderer, Pastor. We spent the last moments in silent prayer, then sang, Come, let us anew our journey pursue. The desire of my heart is intense to work for souls, to so live that every step is obedience. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage for ever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. How true, tis love that makes our cheerful feet in swift obedience move. It is persevering, it continues in storms as well as in sunshine, and is equally constant when driven by fierce winds and adverse tides as when sailing upon a tranquil sea. I remained all night at Mr. Thomas's, greatly enjoyed seeing Brother Dodderer's fine collection of relics from the Holy Land, and the views which Dr. Strong and he took while there. From here we went to Brother Thomas Cope's, where a profitable day was spent. Rev. R. Winna took tea with us. We attended evening services in his church, returned to Brother Cope's. This morning I went through their stocking factory. They employ several hundred hands, make thousands of pairs of hose a day. Sister Thomas Cope presented me with a New Year's gift. May they have their reward." From there I came to Rev. John Thompson's, where I took tea, enjoyed the visit greatly, met Junietta. Thence we went to Bethany Mission for colored people, my first visit to this school in which I have felt a deep interest for years through letters received and the visits of teachers to my room. We had a solemn meeting. January 11th. Another week is almost gone, each day has been marked with interest. I have attended Temperance and Young Men's Christian Association with other meetings. Tomorrow I go to the Mariner's Bethel. Would that I could thank the ladies of New York for the interest they have manifested in having sold Sister Molly's Afghan and some of my books. They write me so kindly. Among many places where my heart was stirred in the work, was the Sunday morning breakfast. Seven or eight hundred men and a few women were seated in a body. Three sandwiches and two cups of coffee were given to each one. While they ate, the visitors on the platform were singing. Then speeches were made, and often encouraging testimonies came from reformed men. The jug system was one of the supports of this work. A little jug was left at business houses, and the employees or customers would leave their contributions. I was greatly interested in this work. At the Franklin Reformatory Home for Inebriates of Philadelphia, the New York Christian Home for Intemperate Men, and at all the temperance meetings, and in many of the prisons and other places, I have seen wonderful work accomplished, through the grace of God, with the instrumentalities used in the reformation of men, some of education and ability who have fallen through drink from prominent positions down almost to degradation have been saved and made new creatures through the power of god the general testimony is i am what i am by the grace of god alone one morning we were talking with a railroad man about my traveling as baggage and always paying full fare i said well, that is past. I would be grateful if I could now travel at even half fare. Just then a friend received a note from blank, with whom he had a talk concerning the matter. He turned to me, saying, 
did thee not just say if half fare was granted thee would be satisfied see here and he handed me a full pass to go home and return during the same day i visited several sick attended ladies meeting at young men's christian association hall also noon services went to see parties at mr john wanamaker's then met an engagement at hannah w smith's where we had a blessed meeting in the evening i attended the second anniversary of the society for the prevention of cruelty to children this was a meeting of peculiar interest to all classes and denominations rev dr dana boardman rev dr mccook a jewish rabbi a roman catholic priest the methodist and episcopal bishops and others were represented either in person or by letters but few have any idea of the work accomplished by the society in behalf of abused children february fifth how thankful i am to have a while at my room i need rest mrs rudolph is so kind thursday i was at dr warren's church did not have the liberty in talking i desired yet trust it was not in vain took tea with mrs e w and met professor e w clark on friday attended the temperance meeting also the lecture of rev h m field d d subject around the world professor e warren clark gave a panorama of the prominent places described by mr field saturday mrs scott called with her carriage to take me to visit an invalid and thence to the children's home in west philadelphia met several interesting cases one little skeleton of a babe was almost starved when it came into the home we had prayers at several places and then returned mrs dr gauss called for me at five p m when seated in the carriage she said how is your faith for the evening there will be much unbelief to meet among the professors and students we shall have quite a company i said i know i am in the path of duty if we do our part and even that which is seemingly a failure i can leave the results in our father's hands by eight p m several physicians and students with rev d c babcock and wife mrs widdenmeyer h w smith mrs jones anna shipley and many others were present making a pleasant parlor meeting i would not give the experience until the physicians consented to honestly investigate the case leaving no room for question at the close professor g said gentlemen and ladies i have a confession to make i have been determined that homeopathy should have all the credit i did not believe that prayer had anything to do with this restoration but i acknowledge i am mistaken i supposed as professor j c morgan was here we would have some help on our side from him but his confirmation is as strong as hers we cannot take the divine interposition out of this case i remained with them all night sabbath eight a m went to the breakfast association had a good meeting afternoon went with sister gauss to the temperance meeting at spring garden hall many hearts were prompted to prayer and praise as usual mothers begged me to pray for their sons oh for power to take hold of each soul that says pray for me sister garrigus had her sunday school class there she calls them her chautauqua girls according to promise went home with sister hart had a rest before tea went over to green street church heard rev r w humphreys preach have promised to be there on wednesday and sabbath evenings monday was a lovely day i had a talk with several sorrowing ones went to mrs l's in time to meet the party who were going to the house of correction we took lunch there professor e m c rev cleveland and mother of brooklyn and others joined us 
among whom were Mr. Duff, one of the managers, his daughter and son. The hack met us. We were taken through the building and over the farm, even in the dairies and piggeries, which were a sight to me, as well as to see the inmates at work. We gave many cards and tracts. They gave me a geranium, which I will take to Ohio. On my way home, the streetcar conductor, to whom I had given tracts several weeks ago, kindly assured me my words had been effectual. Brother Benjamin Crewe, Mr. Pettit, and Mr. Spear spent part of the evening with us in Mrs. Rudolph's parlor. Last night, by request of the pastor, Rev. J. S. J. McConnell, I led the meeting at St. Paul's Church. How very kind Mrs. Scott is! She took Molly out riding, who enjoyed it, but seemed weak and exhausted. As soon as able, she will go home. I hope we can all go soon. I know the time is long to our dear mother. While at Mrs. Scott's, I met Rev. Hurst, D.D., of Drew Seminary, with Sisters S. and Boyd. Had a profitable talk about the work among young men. Friday night I promised to be at the watch meeting and remain all night at Brother I. D. Ware's, who are dear friends. By special request of Mrs. Freeberger, the matron, who is a very dear friend, I spent some days at the Magdalen Asylum, an institution for the shelter and reformation of fallen women. These were days not to be forgotten. The services were all attended with interest. While there are some stubborn cases, others were deeply penitent. Numbers of conversations have occurred at this home. A matron from one of these asylums writes me, Is it right that we as Christians, children of one family, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, and by the one wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved, should draw back and think ourselves holier than these fallen sisters? If we dared to view it in the natural, we might shrink from contact with them. But when we remember it is all of grace that I am as I am, and remembering too, Jesus once said, Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more, and that the way that was made accessible for me is just as free to them, and no other way is made to them but the one that is free to all, and that, too, there was just as much joy in heaven over them as there was over me when I repented, and best of all, Jesus delights to dwell with them, where am I made to differ from them? End of chapter 22「Chapter twenty three of From Baker to Beulah by Jenny Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty three Visiting the Sick. February fourteenth, eighteen seventy nine. Through Sister E. Boyd, who is deeply interested in my welfare, my books were mentioned at the two last meetings. The brethren have sold several copies privately. I shrink from having it done, but the world cannot say I have been working for money. My eye has been single in every step of my way to the glory of God, and through grace it shall continue so. Father, I know that all my life is portioned out for me, and the changes that are sure to come I do not fear to see, but I ask thee for a present mind intent on pleasing thee. Dear Molly started home last night. I will rejoice when Fanny and I can go, but will cheerfully do my duty while we remain, praising the Lord for many opportunities. My friends are pressing me to get my sequel out as soon as possible. I greatly enjoyed going to the newsboys' home. I saw the boys introduced to their new quarters. Number 16, their leader, has a little room furnished by G. W. Childs of The Ledger. One boy said, with a shrug of the shoulders, as he looked at his little bed, Hi, boys, this'll be better than bumming, won't it? 
had a pleasant call from mrs lincoln the singer they want me to attend their meetings but my time is all engaged in company with sister moody i went on saturday to vineland new jersey one of the lovely places not a liquor saloon in the community saturday night had a little meeting at brother peck's sabbath they had three services i remained at rev mr pittenger's during the night suffered with the toothache dr welsh insisted upon fixing my teeth and putting in one i sent a telegram i would not be at philadelphia so spent most of the day in the dental chair felt most grateful for the work done there spent this stormy night at mrs hughes's an anxious wife whose husband was out to sea tuesday morning at six we took the cars for philadelphia went to rev a wallace's office there met mary c and brother g went to our room repacked my valise then to the depot where i met rev van horn and family accompanied them to new york they desired to visit the vessel that he would sail in next day for palestine here we separated i went to mr pox where i found mrs clark waiting for me we went to young men's christian association hall and from there to bethany institute to take a final farewell while at tea mrs r said i promised mrs e congdon that if only for a few moments i would bring you to fifteenth street to see her invalid sister so if it is impossible to go to-morrow we must arrange to go this evening we went and spent a brief but pleasant season with the invalid as we came out mrs r said can we turn away from dr palmer's without a little call as i lifted my heart for direction i answered no we must look in upon them a moment as we entered sister palmer exclaimed how wonderful we were just talking about you sister stevens just said she would have to give up seeing you because there would not be time for her to go to the tabernacle she started to paris next day here we found sister james brother rose and colonel bryant had a blessed little meeting sister r accompanied me on the elevated railway to fifty seventh street to mr clark's where her husband met her wednesday i had several missions to perform in the morning i was rejoiced to have one more visit to these dear homes quite early father mcnamara called soon after mrs mooney one of the five points missionaries came the servants were called up to the parlors so we could have prayer and conversation together before separating i met according to engagement a number of friends at the ladies christian union at broadway tabernacle after six calls went to mr pox gallery and had the photograph taken from which the engraving is made for this book mrs c accompanied me to the elevated cars where we separated met an acquaintance here also on the ferry boat and when i took my seat in the cars a lady from keyport was at my side i saw as the conductor came in he was one who had helped me carry on my cot i showed him the picture saying did you ever carry that invalid on your train he answered yes i did but could scarcely believe i was the same person he soon came in with two of his boys saying they will not believe me they must see for themselves i had a profitable little talk with them they informed me the fourth one the brakesman was killed in an accident between long branch and ocean grove the conductor came in and invited me to go into the baggage car where my cot had traveled this has been a common occurrence seems more natural in the baggage than in the passenger car many of the boys can tell of tracts or what was said to them when they carried me as baggage i arrived at ocean grove quite late here met mr taylor and other railroad boys 
on my way to Thorn Cottage, Brother Imlay would have me stop at the prayer meeting at St. Paul's. Reverend Barnhart was talking when we entered, but, late as it was, we had a little feast, both here and at Mrs. Thorne's. Thursday morning we had a deep snow. I went out on the third-story veranda, where the scene was magnificent. The varied shades of newly painted cottages, the evergreens ornamented with their spires of snow, which spread out before us in an unbroken sheet, greatly contrasted with the mighty, raging ocean. The following Sabbath, Brother J. S. Inskip, who lives next to Thorn Cottage, broke the way and made us a cheery call. Brother Imlay came early and took me to Grace Cottage, where I had matters to attend to. Took dinner at Sister Davidson's, the Trenton House, where with dear friends we had a little farewell meeting. Met Sister Lee in the hack and other acquaintances on the train, among whom was Dr. Stokes. Before I reached Philadelphia, spoke with seven of the railroad boys, who had handled my cot. Arrived at Brother S.B.G.'s at 6 p.m., where they had arranged to have a reunion of our Grace Cottage boarders. I received a message before leaving New York, saying, Do not disappoint us. Some are coming twenty miles to our meeting. I rested until the company gathered. We had a delightful evening of social and spiritual profit. Next day, with Sister G, made several calls on the sick and sorrowing. Had prayer with each one. Our first visit was to Mrs. Daly's Reformed Men's Home, where she had cared for over sixty men the night before, many intelligent-looking men who seemed to be struggling against the terrible foe. We read the scriptures, sang, and had prayers. Among six invalids, we called on one young man who was dying with consumption, but without a hope. The next visit was to Miss Anna Mulford, a happy invalid of long standing. From here I took the car to Mary Chatham's, spent two hours with her, our last meeting. It was a trial to separate, as she was to start for Florida the next day. Received word that Sister Hughes, who had been an invalid for a year, had come from Haddonfield to meet me at Sister Hart's on Green Street. Here we had a refreshing time with congenial spirits, also a little rest before the engagement to meet Brother J. Leeds at the 520 train. I said to myself, how thankful I have no engagement for tonight. But when we arrived at their lovely home in Germantown, dear sister L said, I want thee to go and take a rest before tea, so thee will be refreshed when the carriage comes to take us to Reverend Reddle's church. I said, Must I go out tonight? Well, I shall not be expected to talk in the Episcopal church, so it will be a rest. I shall enjoy hearing Brother Reddle's. We had a good meeting, and, to my surprise, Reverend R. requested me to make a few remarks. Saturday the carriage was ordered to be ready at 9 a.m., spent until noon making calls on the sick and on friends. My friend Dr. Teal was surprised to see me on my feet. After lunch I had two hours or more of rest and sleep. When we went down to dinner, everything looked beautiful with floral decorations. A pleasant little company spent the evening with us, Reverend R. closing with prayer. After all had retired but brother and sister Leeds and his sister Sally, she presented me with a lovely little watch and chain, an article I greatly felt the need of, but never expressed it to any one. I could but feel that the Lord had prompted my dear friend to give me this surprise. Brother L. put in the box with it a five-dollar gold piece. My prayer is that each hour of time may be spent acceptably to him who will reward. Sabbath morning I attended friends' meeting. In the afternoon had a little time with an invalid. 
spent a pleasant evening with the family. End of chapter 23「Chapter twenty four of From Baker to Beulah by Jenny Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty four Newsboy's Reception. February twenty seventh. My motto for the week has been Nearer, my God, to thee. The blessings of these days bring me low at his feet. Monday afternoon, I was invited to meet Reverend Richard Newton at Mrs. S.'s where I remained until Tuesday. When I called at Mrs. Williams's to see Miss Harriet Britton, I enjoyed a rich treat in seeing the large collection of foreign relics. After a busy day, took tea with friend R.J.S. as promised. Went to St. Paul's Church, from here to our room for the last night. Wednesday, 10 a.m. Brother Leeds called for me to go to 12th Street Meeting. This I greatly enjoyed. It was a profitable meeting to my soul. I met many who cheered me by their visits while in the hospital. Being near, I went there and took lunch with our dear matron, Miss Hunter. Brother L. arranged to visit institutions during the afternoon. When he returned for me, we went through the wards and shook hands with all the patients. At one asylum, they rang the bell and called all together so I could bid each one goodbye. After several other calls, we finished at the blind asylum, where we enjoyed a musical treat. From there went to Sister Dunbar's. On each streetcar we gave tracks and talked to the conductors and drivers. It is nothing new to hear such testimony as one gave in answer to the question, Has thee a family? Yes, a lovely little daughter that I never see awake but once a week, for I get home so late and have to leave so early. Sister D. had a number of friends invited for the evening. After social intercourse, Brother Flitcraft led a very interesting meeting of prayer and testimony. Brother S. made the last prayer in this home before I went to the hospital, and the closing one that evening. Many references were made to my first coming here. Precious memories are linked with everything. Last night will not be forgotten. Near the close, I was surprised by Willie and Maudie giving me a beautiful bouquet, and in behalf of kind friends, Sister D. presented me with a beautiful black dress pattern and other articles, one made by Sister Chambers' own hand. This morning, before leaving, we had farewell prayers. After several calls, I went to 608 Arch Street, there found a package containing a silk dress pattern from Sister Jones and a chins from Sister Gauss. Would that I could express to my dear friends my appreciation of their kindness, but I cannot tell my gratitude to man. Came on to Brother H. G.'s, where I shall rest until company comes for the evening. Friday, Mrs. H. G. went with me through the mint, had a note of introduction to Mr. Thompson, who at once recognized us, as did ex-Governor Pollock, who had not seen me on my feet. It was a curiosity to see them manufacturing the silver coins, and to see the ingots of silver and gold piled up like bricks. The cabinet was filled with curiosities. After other calls went to 1512 Chestnut Street, American Tract Society, to see Mr. H. N. Thistle. Went to Charles Sharpless's store. He took us through the building and gave us many ideas of manufacturing goods. After lunch went to 1018 Arch Street to the Friday meeting, which is always crowded. Rev. Anthony Atwood led. While testimonies were being given, he said, We have just heard Lizzie Smith. Now we would like to hear from Jenny Smith. As I closed my few remarks, Louisa Stokes came for me to go with her to the Penn Hospital. Went through this. Had prayers in one ward. From here went to Mrs. C.'s and took a rest. 
On my way to my engagement at the Franklin Reformatory Home, I ran into the Newsboys Home for a few minutes, had a hearty welcome from the boys, asked for some of their real experience. One of them, Tim's friend, gave me an item that a friend of mine put in tract form. It has gone the rounds of the press. I could give a number of items from newsboys and boot blacks, but have space only for Tim's kit. It surprised the shiners and newsboys around the post office the other day to see Limpty Tim come among them in a quiet way and to hear him say, Boys, I want to sell my kit. Here's two brushes, a hull box of blacken, a good stout box, and the outfit goes for two shillings. Goin' away, Tim? queried one. Not exactly, boys, but I want a quarter the awfulest kind just now. Goin' out on excursion? asked another. Not today, but I must have a quarter, he answered. One of the lads passed over the change and took the kit, and Tim walked straight to the counting room of a daily paper, put down his money, and said, I guess I can write it if you'll give me a pencil. With slow-moving fingers, he wrote a death notice. It went into the paper almost as he wrote it, but you might not have seen it. He wrote, Died, little Ted, of scarlet fever. Aged three years. Funeral tomorrow. Gone up to heaven. Left one brother. Was it your brother? asked the cashier. Tim tried to brace up, but he couldn't. The big tears came up, his chin quivered, and, pointing to the notice on the counter, gasped, I, I had to sell my kit to do it, but, but he had his arms round my neck when he d died. He hurried away home, but the news went to the boys, and they gathered in a group and talked. Tim had not been home an hour before a barefooted boy left the kid on the doorstep, and in the box was a bouquet of flowers, which had been purchased in the market by pennies contributed by the crowd of ragged but big-hearted urchins. Did God ever make a heart which would not respond if the right cord was touched? This story I read to the boys, talked with them a little, and had prayer. Then, by consent of the matron, I invited them to come to 1616 Brandywine Street on Monday night for ten minutes. This invitation delighted them. After a half hour at the FRH in company with Miss Canning, called at the Academy of Music. She proposed stopping as we had tickets to the dental commencement. This was a rich treat. From there to her home. I was thankful to make these dear friends a visit. I rested until late Saturday. Miss C. went with me to Mrs. Chambers's, where we had a profitable call. Dr. Morgan would have me go with him to see Reverend Mr. Muchmore. I accompanied Mrs. Morgan and Miss C. to the Incurables' home. We had a pleasant time, yet I felt, after leaving, it might have been made more profitable could we have had more time for prayer. I led the temperance meeting in the afternoon. Albert Vota of Indiana met me there. After a brief visit with Mrs. Jones, I returned to Brother G's for the night, almost too weary to rest. Sabbath morning found me refreshed and ready for the day's engagements. The first was at 8 a.m. at the Breakfast Association. There were nearly 1,000 present. Mr. Duchess, the first speaker, gave an illustration of a vessel bound for Liverpool. She was discovered to be out of her bearings and running near to rocks and shoals, but, the crew obeying their captain's orders, the course was changed and the vessel sailed safely into harbor. So, said the speaker, it is with you. If you will only obey the captain's orders and steer away from these dens of iniquity, which, like the rocks and shoals, are waiting to destroy, and follow the exact course which your compass, the Bible, points out, you will land safely in the harbor of heaven. From this point we went to the penitentiary to attend services there, then through the corridors. 
stopped in several cells and had conversation with the prisoners. Monday a.m., Dr. Child called in his carriage, took me to Gerard College and to Mr. Cahill's, then to 1018 Arch Street. Here I met ministers and other friends. I felt that it was blessed to be at this sacred place and enjoy Brother T. T. Everett's sermon at ministers' meeting. Our farewell reception in the city of brotherly love will ever be set down among my pleasant memories. A company of nearly one hundred gathered at the home of Brother H. G. At the appointed time, I heard the tramp of my newsboys. This feature of the evening was a surprise to the company, but I said to them, Oh, if you ever prayed, do pray now for the next ten minutes. I do want this opportunity to be remembered by them and to bring forth fruit in their lives. The boys filed in across the long parlor in an entirely decorous manner. Several little talks were given by gentlemen present, then we all sang, yield not to temptation. As I shook hands with them and gave them tracts, adding a word here and there, this thought occurred to me for the first time. West of the mountains there are only three boys under seventeen years of age who have ever seen me on my feet. Oh, how earnest was my prayer that I might be a blessing to the children of our land! As the boys bade me good-bye and passed out, one of the guests said, Don't let us forget to pray for the seed sown tonight. Paul may plant, Apollos water, but God giveth the increase. We don't know how many future statesmen and ministers of Christ may be among these newsboys and boot blacks tonight. Soon after the boys were gone, we were again startled as Brother G made a passage among the people and brought in my dear old cot, which I supposed was away uptown. There was the box that had so long confined my limb, and the mattress on which I had lain, everything just as it had looked when I was taken from it. I had a mingling of feelings at this hour. Many of my friends were in tears. Some tender words were said, and as I rose to respond, someone said to me, Jenny, sit down and talk. You have been standing too much. Oh, I said, I can't sit down. Don't talk to me about sitting when I can stand on my feet and look at that box which so long held me bound. If that cot could talk, its story would not be all of suffering. It could tell of wonderful grace that has supported me through all these years. Here I am on the eve of starting to my home in Ohio. Since my feet last trod Ohio's soil, over six hundred persons who have stood at my bedside are in their graves, and here am I, the spared monument of God's amazing mercy. May he bless every soul who has ever handled that cot or shaken hands with me while I lay upon it. The cot has been doing good service since I was done with it, for several invalids have used it. We expected to leave on the midnight train. Brother I. D. Ware, having learned that we had not secured tickets for a sleeping car, went of his own kindness to attend to it. But none could be had, so we remained until the next morning, he having arranged for us in a Pullman car. This was greatly to our advantage, and we were deeply grateful for his kindness. He came with others of our dear friends to see us start for home. A page from my journal. March 5th. On the train. Crossing the Juniata, the mountain peaks on each side of us are lovely. The ice-crowned tops contrast so strangely with the black points here and there. We passed Horseshoe Bend after night. It was a beautiful sight, illumined as it was, and the furnace fires added to the witchery of the scene. Just after midnight, while enjoying a good sleep, the porter roused us, saying, A broken wheel, we must change cars. There was some ill humor manifested, but the porter exclaimed, You may be thankful to get off with nothing worse. We narrowly escaped a serious accident. We reached Columbus at 6.30 a.m., 
our friends had expected us the day before when i did not appear one said let us go through to the baggage car and see if she isn't there all were astonished at the great change in me business matters detained me until the next day so in the afternoon cousin t c barrett took me to the state house met governor bishop and other acquaintances also dr freeman we reached dayton sooner than our friends expected fanny walked home but my old friend lottie fallis whom i met in the depot took me home in her buggy my precious mother was perfectly overcome i feared the result of the shock as she was very feeble her first words as she took me in her arms were praise the lord after a while i lay down on the sofa and she said that is more natural now i can sit down and talk to you i cannot realize that you can walk only think i have not seen you on your feet for over seventeen years we had many callers who had been doubting thomas's dr c said well well i have looked forward to this hour for a long time and can hardly believe my own eyes it's truly wonderful such testimonies were not unusual sabbath morning brother f m lees my faithful old friend took me to grace church dr hoyt preached i walked up those steps with a grateful heart my return home revived many memories in every association there were reminders of the past in the afternoon brother and sister p called and took mother and me to raper church love feast there met dr pern now our presiding elder he did not recognize me until brother m p gaddis referred to his feelings on meeting me at grace church in the morning some one asked him is this jenny he answered it's not the old time jenny but a new addition my first visit was to the sick mrs winters called for me on tuesday to go and see sister hammond soon after she passed away triumphantly how true that quote, among the sweet sounds that vibrate through the earth none are sweeter than home none hath greater power to stir the fount of feelings and wake tender memories of the past true and worthy affections which are as angel guides to the naturally wayward but striving heart all the choicest blessings of life cluster here and there are none so hardened or perverse as not to have a cord somewhere which can be touched by the tender remembrances of home it may be deeply embedded in a rough nature well nigh destroyed by crime but traces of it remain longer than anything else the heart of the culprit melts and the tears of the prisoner flow as a loving hand applies the pressure in sickness and sorrow in any and all circumstances we turn to home a mother's care how sweet the name what is a mother's love a noble pure and tender flame enkindled from above to bless a heart of earthly mould the warmest love that can't grow cold this is a mother's love End quote. march twentieth be ready for any work the master may bring before you and remember that waiting on him when all seems dark and discouraging is often counted truer service in his sight than the more active work we would choose ourselves but which to be pleasing to him must be done in the power gained by such secret abiding in his presence End quote. i surely need time alone but there is a sweet abiding in my soul this has been a busy day mrs hickson and mrs gravett called i went with them to temperance meeting from there with mrs m b parmalee to the store met mrs ribold and others took tea with mrs p end of chapter twenty four Chapter twenty five of From Baker to Beulah by Jenny Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty five Prayers Answered. 
March 25th. Last Friday night went to Raper Church, remained all night at Sister P's, and went with her to Springfield, Ohio, to attend the holiness meeting at the Central M.E. Church. We were assigned to Mrs. J. Kinney, who was an old acquaintance. Met here Sister Fanny Williams, brother and sister Davis of Mechanicsburg, Ohio, and many other friends. All were astonished to see me in such health. Brothers Brunton, J. Noggle, Gunn, and others sang joyful praises when we met. These have been blessed days. Came home on 6 a.m. train, met a number of the railroad boys and policemen who helped me when on my cot. I long to be a blessing to all that have been kind in the past. On my way from the depot, called at the Christian Publishing House. There met Rev. McKinnon. In the afternoon, Sister Winters called for me to go to the soldiers' home. We had a good meeting. Many of the boys remembered my being there on my cot. How I would enjoy going with the ladies every week to their service. Chaplain Earnshaw says, These ladies will only know in heaven the good they do. Our visit at the hospital was very affecting. Sister P. sang, Sister W. and I made remarks and prayed. The fields all about us are white with harvest. Many invitations come to go and labor. Called to see Miss Susie Gebhardt, who is a great sufferer. She said to me, It seems wonderful that you are well, and here I am an invalid. Would that I could be the comfort to her that she has been to me spent an hour at sister howard's had prayers with them they are in deep sorrow her aunt and daughter will be buried from her home at one funeral we little know what a day will bring forth another pressing invitation from brother kemp to come there and write my book he says you must not disappoint us your room is all ready oh how i long to do this work at home but i find the demands upon my time are too great so it will be impossible we are so happy in our home and our dear family altar though broken is sacred here we can bow and carry each absent loved one on the wings of faith and prayer if we could only get some tidings from our dear brother mother feels he cannot be living or we would hear from him her constant prayer is that we may finally all meet in heaven. April 1, 1879. The dear friends of Green Street Church, Philadelphia, with others, have sent me a sewing machine. Sister H. said the general impression was that I received the regular collections taken whenever I spoke. They, knowing that this was not so, felt i must have some token of their appreciation of my labors and had sent it god bless each one saturday dr crawford took me to zimmermanville where i remained over sabbath attended two services rev david winters preached in the morning they requested me to speak at the evening service i consented had a full house Today I called the telescope office, met Reverends Esvenida, Shuey, and Berger, went to the soldier's home, took tea at Sister G. Hoagland's, then went, in company with Mother Stewart, to a temperance meeting. How faithful Sister Mary Bowman has been in this work! Brother H. came after me to go to Urbana, had to refuse, but promised to go as soon as possible. I go next to Brother Gaddis's at Miami City. Dr. Leonard wants me to give my experience at our own Grace Church Sabbath evening. Blessed Lord, direct me. I have finally concluded to go to Brother Kemp's next week. Shall fill other engagements from there. It is a trial to leave home, mother and all, as we have seen so little of each other for so long but I cannot doubt this way is opened by him whose will I desire above all things to serve. Our faith is often both tried and strengthened by circumstances. 
I feel that I have not one desire apart from that which may promote his glory. I am so thankful dear mother agrees with me in this decision. We could scarcely endure the separation were it not for the I single. I cannot afford to let self come into anything. In every step of my way, I want the consciousness that he leadeth me. Fanny will soon return east. Tuesday, April 8, 1879. London, Madison County, Ohio. Lo, I come with joy to do my blessed master's will, him in outward works pursue and serve his pleasure still. Faithful to my Lord's commands, I still would choose the better part, serve with careful Martha's hands and loving Mary's heart. Truly I can say, wonderful are the ways of our Lord. Blessed be his holy name for making my way so clear. Did ever one of his weak, unworthy children have more to praise him for than I? Sabbath took dinner with Sister Glasgow in Dayton, deeply felt the responsibility of the evening service, had a crowded house. Yesterday, as I was planning to go on a mission, Sister P came with her carriage, thus enabling me to do my duty, also took me to the train. I brought dear mother to South Charleston, where we remained until today, visited Aunt Fanny, cousins W. Barrett's and Mel Peters. Brother Kemp met me at the train. They gave me a hearty welcome, but were disappointed that mother was not with me. I am glad that Brother K. has sent for her to come in the morning. It will do her good. When they brought me to my room, I was overcome with the cheering appearance that greeted me. The first thing was to return thanks and invoke God's blessing upon all the hours and associations of this place. I have been pleasantly located before, but this excels most of the marked leadings of the past. I am in the northeast corner room upstairs, where I have a lovely view of London and the surrounding country. A bright, cheerful carpet and new furniture, with the evidence of its being God's chosen spot, make this a pleasant place and sacred to my soul. May the time spent here be to the glory of God. After my return home from the east, daily calls were coming for the sequel to The Valley of Baca. I made every effort to turn my attention to writing, but was constantly interrupted, and began to feel that my way was hedged up in this work. On our way to Springfield, Sister Pritz said, Jenny, where are you going to write that book? I said, I cannot tell. I am almost discouraged in trying to write, but I have committed it all to the hands of him who will direct me. Several have invited me to their homes to write, but I would not be any more retired than at our home. Here the matter was left. Before Brother Kemp left S, he came to me, saying, Sister Jenny, no man has more to praise God for than I have. I was snatched as a brand from the burning. Years ago, when going to destruction, I was arrested by the Spirit of God and brought from darkness into the light of liberty in Christ Jesus. He has blessed and prospered me. I have a pleasant, happy home and one of the best Christian wives that lives. Now Sister P tells me you want to write your book. The moment she mentioned it, I was impressed that the Lord would be pleased to have you come to us and write it. You can have a room up or downstairs, and things just as you want them. But I do not want to make a mistake, so will go home and tell my wife about it, and if she feels as I do, we shall know that this is of the Lord. We will tell you frankly how we feel after prayerfully considering the matter." Letters from them soon assured me that this was the place. April 11th. Dear Mother has gone home. She greatly enjoyed this visit and will feel satisfied to know I am so pleasantly situated. Now I must improve the moments. As I turn to my writing, in obedience bowing low at the feet of Jesus, my cry is, Lord, what wouldst thou have me to do? I have just here a thought that comforts me. 
a humble knowledge of myself is a better way to God than ever so earnest a search after science. I know I am the Lord's, cannot doubt this when I see all I have come through, what ways have opened and how I have been provided for. In suffering have been supported by grace. Surely what deliverance I have had! What liberty has been granted me before the people in times of extremity! But I came to this work feeling just as ignorant and helpless as when I commenced the Baker. Oh, that God may bless the sequel as he has the first! Blessed Lord, I want souls benefited by the work done in this room. Let blessings come to this home. O oh, prepare my heart, Holy Spirit! Give unction in words that will be fitly spoken. Thou knowest my need of increased wisdom, of spiritual, mental, and physical strength. Let thy own name be honored and glorified. With confidence I now look up. Faith, mighty faith, the promise sees, and looks to that alone, laughs at impossibilities, and cries, It shall be done. Had an acceptable call from Rev. J. C. Jackson, the Methodist Episcopal pastor. He desires me to give my testimony in his church Sabbath evening. On consultation, we find that it will be necessary to set apart a reception day for visitors. He proposed announcing this, so that there would be an understanding among the people. Have received letters from Urbana and Waynesville. Find I cannot be released from my engagement at those places. End of chapter 25Chapter twenty six of From Baker to Beulah by Jenny Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty six A Cure for Hasty Temper. April eighteenth. Last evening started for Urbana. At Springfield went to see Mr. Howard in behalf of railroad work. Gives much encouragement. Took tea at Rev. W. A. Robinson's. On the train met Maggie Daly and Brother Miltenberger of Bellefontaine. When we reached Urbana, a carriage was waiting, and conveyed me to Brother Happersett's. No one but Brother H. expected me until this afternoon. Had a number of calls, among them Brothers L. Z. Lance and Hartzler. In the evening we attended the entertainment at Young Men's Christian Association Hall for the benefit of the reading room, where, as they had arranged for it, I gave a brief talk. All the churches were represented, most of the ministers being present, few of the people ever having seen me on my feet. Have several engagements for tomorrow. Take tea at Mr. I. Happersett's and attend a railroad meeting in the evening. Monday, April 21st. Yesterday I attended several services gave my experience at a union meeting, went to the Howard Weaver Mission last evening, remained all night with Brother B. F. Dixon, was so amused when he showed me a spoiled piece of wax fruit that Sister D. and I tried to make years ago. He laughed, saying as I recognized it, Oh, it's Jenny, this is proof. I felt as though it must be an impostor showing off for you, so I thought I'd see. Brother H. brought me to Spring Hills. We called this morning on Rev. Thompson, went into Mr. Glenn's old home for a few minutes. How everything brings up memories of other years! Dear Sister Sally, Brother Frank, and all, say they can scarcely believe their own eyes. Had nearly forty calls today, and a crowded house in the evening at the dear old church on the hill. In relating in this place the dealings of the Lord, I live it all over again. April 22nd. How interesting sisters' children are! Here I am writing where I last stood upon my feet. As I came into the room, I closed the door and knelt in the same spot where I last knelt and prayed in 1862. Everything looks so natural. Many of the people have changed but little. 
the old apple tree where i used to watch the robins build their nests still stands the water in the old well is as fresh and cold as ever through the kindness of luther leonard i took a ride upon the hill where i could view the country then went to the churchyard where many new graves have been made since i walked there how many graves i visited of those who have stood beside my cot my dear friend's brother and sister lance came for me so after dinner we bade the loved ones good-bye and started on our way stopped a few moments at west liberty and met mr henkel dr leonard rev william fitzgerald mr davis and others came to this home where providence so called me in darker days little expecting to see grandma l again on earth brother yoder and a large company spent the evening here we trust these hours have been profitable april twenty fourth last night will not be forgotten yesterday came to springfield with conductor dow and mr cash who have carried me so often as baggage took tea with miss minnie la rue then went to hear rev joseph cook lecture on god in natural law a rich treat both to meet and hear him he wants my book as soon as published the remainder of the evening until midnight was spent at the central m e church brother myers's class met and continued the meeting in memory of my anniversary one year last night since i walked we had a thanksgiving time several brethren from urbana were present this morning in company with rev robinson mrs lawrence and mother stewart we visited wittenberg college at chapel service by invitation of dr helwig we each made a few remarks what might be accomplished if these students would heed the admonitions given them and dare to do right in the face of temptation after a delightful week at my work i came home to spend one night while on my way to waynesville mother was so rejoiced to see me spent an hour with mrs s who died soon after a profitable talk with sister mary b concerning temperance work spent the two hours at xenia with sister m conable and her mother on the train met professor smith and others spent nearly three pleasant and profitable days in the home of my old pastor rev l f van cleve on my return to brother kemp's i felt impressed to see the baggage master when i mentioned my mission to the conductor he at once invited me to the baggage car to my surprise there lay an invalid on a cot they thought him asleep but i said i cannot leave this car without speaking to him as i approached the cot found it was brother ingersoll a minister from the soldiers home the ladies had sent for me several times to see him before he left but i was not at home this meeting was a special providence may twenty three eighteen seventy nine well does mrs savage say christians are witnesses to the power of god's grace to the sweetness of his comforts to the truth of his promises and the tenderness of his providences my soul testifies to this with tears of gratitude i have just read the cheering letters of dr c c moore and wife also mr and mrs a burdett smith of new york they write encouragingly about reading the valley of baca the latter has so kindly advertised it in his elite although i cannot secure the whole number of subscribers i appreciate fully their kind offer while i can heartily recommend it as being among the best of fashion magazines and i know it is a blessing to many i find it impossible for me to do anything of the kind in connection with my work may my dear friends have their reward for i am sure they desire to aid me in getting out my book it is just like them to say we want to give you practical sympathy is why we make the offer to you of two hundred subscriptions toward the publishing of your book 
this has been a pleasant and profitable day reverend jackson and wife sisters sparks and ritzel spent the day with us had other calls in the morning brother j will be a valuable critic he spent some time in reading manuscript and gives me much encouragement have spent a delightful evening with the family the baby georgie is becoming so fond of me it is a real rest to run downstairs and have a play with him and charlie sister k is a congenial lovely woman all are so interested and so anxious to make me happy even joseph the hired man and billy the irishman the latter had a good laugh when i told him about bridget even before i became interested in father mcnamara's work in new york i had some strange experience with irish girls i will give one incident i was one evening surrounded by a group bridget like many others had a great tender heart but her terrible temper often caused her trouble she complained of this and i said to her why bridget we are trying to get to the same heaven is not my jesus your saviour too he is as willing and able to help you overcome your besetments as well as mine or anybody else's yes but i'm a catholic he will bless a catholic just as quick as he will a methodist or any other name if you come to him in the right spirit i once had a fearful temper was a selfish wilful girl there is no telling what might have come of me if the grace of god had not changed my heart can't you ask jesus to give you a new heart and create within you a right spirit oh but this irish mad is awful i would be glad if i could get it out of me bridget not long ago i heard a scotchman who has overcome his temper say i believe when a scotchman gets angry he is worse than any irishman that lives oh oh exclaimed bridget raising both hands with a look of horror then what will you do with poor bridget when there's both scotch and irish blood in her veins our talk i learned was not in vain each of these girls as many others have begged me to pray for them sabbath june first i spent at south charleston attended two services took tea at cousin m peters's by request of rev s smith gave my experience at evening meeting john heaton an invalid was taken to church in his wheeled cot i was deeply affected to see him as i walked behind them felt as though it was a dream could scarcely realize it was i walking behind the chair just like the one i had occupied june ninth just returned was called home suddenly on business left dear mother feeble came to s c on saturday sabbath a m went to williams chapel to quarterly meeting rev s brewster preached a grand sermon followed by the sacrament brother davidson met me there i had services at their home the infirmary in the afternoon we had a full house it was a sad sight to see the little ones there one bright little boy and his sister stood side by side and mrs d said to the little boy willie if a real good man would give you a nice home would you go his chin quivered as he gave a tender loving look at his sister and with the starting tears answered no i don't want to leave minnie would you if the gentleman would take minnie too oh yes then i'd go i went through the building shook hands with all the inmates few people have the interest in these public institutions that the work demands how those who have the care and responsibility of them feel it how they could be strengthened in their work mrs d is well adapted to her position she has a heart touched with the infirmities of all june twenty third five a m may this be a week full of work yesterday was a feast of fat things 
at the basket meeting on Brother Pancake's place, led by Brother Verity, met Brother Teeters and Sister Whitridge. A happy day for Brother Kemp. Saturday, 28th, Newport. At Brother Withrow's, Mrs. K.'s father. Can go on with my work here, it is so quiet. Reverend Garrison brought me out last evening, took tea with them, filled an engagement at his church, Protestant Methodist. Reverend Spar, P.E., of Columbus, preached on God's love. Tomorrow we have a missionary service. Hope brothers Rankin and Kemp will come. So glad Dr. Moore's medicine is doing good. How strange we all had the chills several weeks ago. Brother K. said he would send for Brother B.'s remedy, asked me to write, as he was in a hurry. I told them we would forward the money soon as we knew the medicine could be had. No envelopes were at hand without going downstairs, except those with my stamp on, so I directed one of those. Soon a long answer came back found that medicine was made by Dr. C. C. Moore of New York, an acquaintance of Ocean Grove, who there had bought my book and had been trying to trace me up. He said he wanted the first copy of the sequel, would give five dollars for it. He sent a large package of his pillules and gave me such a percent that this proved a special providence in opening my way to continue my writing." This medicine broke the chills, not only in ourselves, but in many others. July 1st. I spent four days in Columbus, Saturday and Sabbath evenings at Wesley M. E. Church. Sabbath, 4 p.m., a railroad meeting at the depot, and Monday evening at Rev. J. M. Cusky Heath's Church. There were many old friends in C. from different places. Did space permit, I could fill pages with these days. Spent one profitable Sabbath with friends at Selma, Ohio, where three meetings were held. Took dinner at Samuel Howell's, and spent the night at Seth Smith's with Esther Frame and her family. July 16th, 6 a.m. Breakfast over. Lovely sunrise. The view from here is grand. We had a strengthening time around the family altar. What an advantage it is to have the early hours! How much can be accomplished from five until eight! I would love to remain in this sacred place, but I must go tomorrow. Shall not return until camp meetings are over. My only desire is to know fully my Lord's will. I cannot doubt my duty in the campaign before me. They engaged me to attend these meetings before I left the East. I have responsibilities that must be met. July 22nd, Blanchett Station, Kentucky, at Mr. Dugan's. I went home last Friday, 7 a.m., had much to attend to that day and Saturday. Sabbath attended four services, two open-air meetings, one at the park, and at 6 p.m. at the Soldier's Home. 7 a.m. yesterday took train for Cincinnati. Reverend Ketchum met me at the train, went to Methodist Book Concern, found many acquaintances among those coming to the minister's meeting, but few had seen me on my feet. Dr. Walden, brothers Ketchum, Hypes, and others insisted upon my going into the minister's meeting, after which Reverend J. Pearson had me go home with him. It was a treat to meet Sister P., my friend of other days. 4 p.m. I took the train for this place. My precious brother James was waiting. As I came out of the car, he lifted me to the platform, saying, with a joyful heart, Oh, my sister, is it possible this is you? He had to stop several times and look at me before we reached the house. I shall go with him this morning to Mr. Norman's, and Mr. M. Stevens will take us to his home some six miles, where they expect me at their meeting tonight. Dear boy, it is a great pleasure to be with him. I have here taken my first horseback ride over these hills. It was quite a romance for me. 
july twenty fifth according to engagement i went to loveland campground in company with sisters p and whitstone here as at all the places visited lived over the experience while on my cot the past came up vividly the first of the feast was the closing of the sunday school encampment dr vincent lectured subject on deck and dr payne the needs of the hour camp meeting opened on saturday services were all full of interest they desired my experience on tuesday that night several of us felt a concern for the colored people the landlord was much pleased when a meeting was proposed for them and a room was arranged to hold it in the next day brother p and a party came out from the city sister p insisted upon my going to their table before i was through eating sister kelly came to me saying we have a disappointed waiter do you see that bouquet on the post at our table he says where is our lady gone i went to de woods and made dat bouquet case dis is her last meal wid us i went back to our own table to eat my dessert to let those waiters know that i appreciated that little act of kindness which was the means of a work being accomplished for souls the landlord invited me to go through the kitchen pantry laundry and all so i could shake hands and give a tract or card to each servant in the hotel just before i left they all came into the dining room and sang two pieces for us spent the night at brother p's mount auburn cincinnati called to see my engraver f e jones first time we ever met he shook hands saying how glad i am to see you as i replied it's a pleasure to meet you rev p called from the buggy only five minutes to reach the train i said good-bye brother jones i'll send you a photograph after this he came to see me but our brief interview was equally disturbed we met no more until the engraving was made spent two hours at lockland with my invalid friend miss mcgown End of chapter 26chapter 27 of from baker to beulah by jenny smith this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 27 ohio and indiana yearly meetings august 1st went out to embury park camp meeting where we remained two weeks my heart was deeply interested in the work assigned me in having charge of the children's meetings i had written to christine herman an invalid friend at heidelberg germany telling her i had promised to take charge of the children and if providence permitted we should be at camp meeting sabbath august third and she sent the following message to be read to the children that day dear children i send you love across the ocean do you love jesus oh i love him and that makes me so happy in all my affliction i have been an invalid for twenty-four years oh children in jesus the mind is happy and peaceful always do not forget to pray for your afflicted friend christine a number of the children answered her note i also received a letter on saturday from a friend in paris france who enclosed some rose leaves in return for some i had sent her they were crushed but their fragrance was still sweet so with us we may be crushed and wilted by suffering and sorrow but in the midst of this what will make our lives useful jesus love in our hearts that is the fragrance the children answered i told them of a beautiful rose brought to my room when i first went to the home of mr k how cheerful it was i sent leaves from that rose to paris germany india and five of our own states think how many enjoyed one little rose how many hearts even a little boys or girls can cheer by their bright happy lives if their hearts belong to jesus children can learn a great many lessons in their plays 
One day, we had a doll baby at our meeting. It could move its head, hands, and feet, and open and shut its eyes. It seemed wonderful for a doll, yet the children named many things we could do that Dolly could not. See, hear, talk, walk, etc. The question was asked, What do you have that Dolly has not? One little boy answered earnestly, It's got no thinker. After Brother Carland told us that his Sunday school teacher won the hearts of his scholars by a plate of bread and butter, it occurred to us that we could have a treat for the little folks which would help impress the lessons taught. The matter was mentioned to a few of the parents and friends, and a little surprise of cake, candies, and peaches was prepared. We trust they will not soon forget the impressions made by this in connection with Sister Robinson's children's talk. Each day was filled with interest. Mrs. L. O. Robinson, Reverend Barnes, Brother and Sister Bergaman, and other prominent workers labored through the meeting. Mrs. Griffith, Mother Stewart, and Miss Nettie Moore came to the temperance meetings. We were favored with special music by the Red Lion Choir, which rendered efficient service on the Sabbath the meeting closed. Monday morning, August 18th, they gave us a rich treat, thus celebrating my birthday. As written by one of their party, we shall ever keep green in our hearts the memories of acquaintances formed here. That evening, after spending a half hour at home, went to the Urbana camp meeting, where they had expected me several days before. Reverends Leonard, Runyon, Richards, Professor Stevens, and Brother Ketchum met me on the train soon had a glad welcome to the pleasant cottage home of brother kemp where i found my kind friend had arranged all for the sale of my books and views from which i realized much benefit i remained until the meeting broke up many memories of past associations were revived i met hundreds of acquaintances many of whom had to see me before they really believed that i could walk friday on our way to the train eleven of us went to see the new grace church in urbana we had a little consecration meeting around the altar and a soul was blessed that left the campground with a burdened heart returned home with sister molly as a storm detained me saturday i felt it duty to rest quietly on sabbath Monday morning started with mother to cousin David Corey's at Carlisle, Clark County, Ohio. Spent a very pleasant evening there. The next day we all attended the Union Camp Meeting, three miles distant, going to and from the meeting morning and evening, except one night I remained at Brother Thomas's on the ground. One day, after I had occupied some time, Reverend Thomas, a Baptist minister, and Brother C., to my surprise, took up a collection which amounted to thirteen dollars. Besides, sold a number of books, which Cousin Corey had brought from Urbana. Mother greatly enjoyed the visit, as she had not been here for thirty years. We returned home on Friday, found a telegram from Mount Pleasant to come to the Ohio Yearly Meeting of Friends, also a message to come to the state camp meeting at Delaware, Ohio. I had a longing to spend Sabbath with mother, and went to my room to seek direction. Presently mother came to the door, saying, I would like to have you at home, but it is clear that you must go to one place or the other. I shall not be uneasy, for it appears to be your duty to go. When I arrived at Columbus, the temptation was strong to go to Delaware. The long distance and expense to Mount Pleasant seemed a barrier, but I felt relieved when I obeyed the promptings and bought my ticket for Mount Pleasant. While waiting at Steubenville, I found Dr. Reed, of the female seminary, lived quite near, called and spent a pleasant hour, then took the train for Portland Station ascertained the telegram I sent from C had gone out so late I could not expect anyone to meet me. 
could only get an open buggy to go the remaining eight miles. Had just started when we met Willie Updegraff coming for me. We reached his father's, David Updegraff, at 10 p.m. I was excused from seeing any one that night, as I was very weary. Sabbath morning I felt refreshed. Nearly thirty congenial friends were guests in this home. The soul feast began at worship, early in the morning, and lasted all day. Attended three services, gave my experience in the afternoon. Monday, with a large company, dined at Brother Hussey's. After devoting the evening to mission work, went home with Brother Hills. Tuesday morning, Brother Updegraff presented me, in behalf of this people, with thirty-six dollars. In addition to this, several books and sets of views were sold. After meeting, I dined with Mrs. Williams, president of the Presbyterian Missionary Society, then attended their meeting, and met a Sabbath school class to whom their teacher had read The Valley of Baca. That evening I went to Steubensville and spent the night with Dr. Reed at the seminary. Wednesday, September 3rd. Returned to Urbana, Ohio. The M.E. Conference being in session there, at Grace Church, spent a delightful week attending most of the meetings. Bishop Simpson presided. September 11th went to St. Paris, where friends had arranged for one meeting for me. Friday returned home, where I found company waiting. The hours of the next six days were filled with work. September 16th had a visit from F. E. Jones, the engraver of Cincinnati. On the train I met Professor Sunderland and Sister Fitzgerald. She would have me go to the parsonage until ready to go to Gladdy Creek, where we spent the night, then went on to Spring Hills. Arrangements were made for a series of meetings to be held here the next week. Friday evening, Brother David Plank took me to his home in the country, where I spent a pleasant evening with friends. Saturday visited Brothers Joseph Plank and S. Hedding, whose home was one of affliction. Sister H. has since gone home to heaven. Spent that night at Brother Zooks's. Sabbath afternoon, I filled an engagement at the Amish Sabbath school. The house was crowded, met many dear friends of other days. Saturday received word they expected me at Bellefontaine that evening. I sent a note stating that I would not be there. They must not make arrangements for a meeting until Tuesday. Sabbath I could not get away from the feeling that I ought to go to Bellefontaine that night, and, while brothers Z were anxious for me to remain, they could not insist. We made arrangements to go after meeting closed. I only had time to say generally, how do you do, and goodbye to one and all. I longed to shake hands with each one, but the buggy was at the door. Brother Zooks was hastening home, for he wanted to change horses before we could go on. As we came to their gate, we met Dr. Wilson, who said, Why, you are going the wrong way. Did you not send a note last evening, saying you would not be in B tonight? I answered, I did. It was sent by a colored man to Mr. Pollock. Well, from some cause he did not receive it. This morning word was given out in all churches that you would be at the M.E. church tonight. I questioned, What, not have meeting tonight? Why, how can we get there in time? It is five now, and eight miles to go. He answered, You get into my buggy. I'll get you there in time, for you must not disappoint the people. They have been expecting you to come so long. When we drove up to Brother Daly's, the people were going to church. Brother P. came in. On inquiry, he said, the pastor is sick, and you are expected to occupy the evening in relating your experience. The people are anxious to see and hear you. The house will be crowded. We had but a few moments. I prayed earnestly for guidance. 
oh how i trembled in view of meeting this congregation of familiar faces only three or four had seen me since my restoration as i walked into the church where so many memories of the past were clustered i could praise the lord that this was a real experience and not a dream i remained here until wednesday time was improved besides meeting many friends attended two meetings a day as i went to sister mckee's the little room that was our first home in b and the place where i last saw the face of brother dicky with emotion i prayed in the same spot where he knelt at my cot his last words seemed to be re-echoed don't forget to pray for me spent the night at brother j chambers's have long been interested in their children's home which now numbers seventeen i desired to see the spot where they expect to have an orphan's home built in company with brother c and wife sister clift and lizzie slicer we visited the place knelt on the spot where we anticipate a faith home will ere long be erected where many little homeless ones will find a shelter under the protection of these worthy friends whose labor and care is surely prompted by love for the unfortunate september twenty fifth at de graff ohio was met by brothers haynes and bull among other sick friends called on dr hance the only physician now living of nine that treated me up to eighteen sixty nine in eighteen sixty four and sixty five he came five miles and made thirty-three visits without any charge he always administered spiritual comfort as well as made professional visits attended one meeting at m e church had a full house twenty-sixth returned to spring hills where arrangements were made for a series of meetings from friday night until wednesday there were two meetings a day and five services on sabbath with large attendance people came from urbana belfontaine de graff quincy and other parts of the country i called on nearly every family and as i bowed and prayed in many homes memories of other days were revived it was a great pleasure to be with sister sally and her family for years we have enjoyed each other's society so little that any reunion is a blessing since that visit the angel of death has taken from their home their little prattling fanny how can we give thee up how let thee go but here is rest tis joy to know for them comes not of sin or woe our other lambs may go astray but not so these o saviour they are in thy fold some day will enter too within thy fold beyond the gates of pearl and gold miss dewitt richmond indiana saturday night october five eighteen seventy nine my dear journal how vain i find it to commit all i have felt to your pages wednesday morning i visited and prayed with sixteen families spending but a few moments with each dr hales dined with us at brother frank's before leaving my loved ones i felt we must have prayers once more in our dear old home dr wilson mrs e terrell mrs rexter and others were present my soul yearns for a special work to be accomplished in every family mrs pitman and her mother took me out to calvin smith's wednesday night i filled an appointment in the christian church at gladdy creek mother came over with mr gerard rev mr and mrs lawrence and mrs kugel came from b had a good congregation brother s insisted on taking a collection i trust the friends at the amish church belfontaine de graff and spring hills will be rewarded by the blessing of god resting on the seed sown thursday i was obliged to meet parties at the belfontaine fair met several hundred acquaintances from there we went to west liberty john alguire took mother and me to brother c yoder's where quite a company were awaiting us i was very tired 
yet we spent a pleasant evening closing with singing and prayer next day on our way to urbana to take the train i called at brother lance's for a few moments these homes where the most of baca was written leave a blessed memory only in heaven will they and brother kemp know how much they have done to help me in the writing of my books i arrived home at three o'clock p m yesterday oh so glad for a few hours rest here this afternoon i took the train for richmond indiana they expected me several days ago in coming into the home of brother e bellis vividly i remember the suffering it cost me to reach here before oh that i may have as direct a leading now as on my former visit to wayne county of one thing i am confident it is my duty to return to my writing as soon as possible i shall need wisdom to direct me in the economy of time the yearly meeting of friends was in session i greatly enjoyed these sittings and meeting with friends from far and near time was improved wednesday i went to chester thursday to vota's station friday to dover held meetings at each place saturday to brother luke woodward's where on sabbath morning we attended new garden meeting in the afternoon led a crowded house at newport now called fountain city also an evening meeting monday called at brother henley's dined at brother lee Perviance's, and went on to middleborough tuesday was taken by brother nichols to earlham college friday rev p carland came for me to go to centerville attended four services here an unusual feature of these meetings was the great number of children who attended without any special arrangement the first four front and the side pews were filled with little boys and girls oh that laborers would take hold of the boys and girls of our land with more interest friday a m returned to richmond during the day with sisters b and hadley called on several in affliction that evening by special request gave an account of my restoration i felt it a privilege to walk into the homes in wayne county where the memories of former associations were revived calls began in the morning had an earnest talk with an unsaved man then rev e s freeman of dublin and a m whittaker of grand rapids michigan a blind brother and with others this was a remarkable day sister rhoda coffin came for me to dine with them afternoon a committee of the young men's christian association gathered at brother b's we bowed earnestly asking god's blessing before going out upon the work of the afternoon we then had a drive to the country at the beautiful home of mr gar with brother and sister b brothers hudson and dickinson we had another hour of profitable conversation and prayer took tea as promised at rev mr enders's the lutheran pastor whose history in affliction has been so similar to my own that i spent the early evening with great interest in their home going out to earlham later matron and superintendent wright were waiting for me sabbath it was a pleasure to meet with this household sacred memories clustered around almost every room as was the case in all the places where my cot tarried for a night that afternoon i attended a crowded union service of young men's christian association at the presbyterian church the meeting was called for the purpose of arousing a deeper interest in the work of saving young men there was a real enthusiasm in the congregation i am sad when i think of the many who are throwing their lives away who are wasting their god-given talents so carelessly day by day and my heart is filled with a longing to reach them a helping hand to draw them away from the peril in which they unconsciously stand after spending two days with my dear mrs pritz in milton indiana she returned with me to dayton the home she so recently left 
End of chapter 27「Chapter twenty eight of From Baker to Beulah by Jenny Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty eight Women's Temperance Convention. October twenty ninth. In company with the delegates, Mother Stewart, Sisters Berger, Pritz, and Van Doren, had a pleasant ride to Indianapolis, where the annual meeting of the Women's National Christian Temperance Union was being held. It was a grand body of the noble women of our country, presided over by Mrs. Wittenmeyer. The convention found much to encourage the temperance people of the land in the reports of the progress of the cause, but all felt the need of more earnest work, and laid plans that, under God, will doubtless result in greatly advancing the cause. November 8th. When the cares of life are pressing, with a weight we scarce can bear, what a stream of endless blessing flows to us from over there. Thursday evening, Mrs. Sarah Smith, the matron, sent for Sister Francesco and me to go to the State Reformatory for Women, had an interesting meeting with the inmates in the chapel. Next morning, as I went through the prison and other departments, shaking hands with each inmate, I thought that those in charge of this great work can realize the force of these lines as they see the fruit of their labor amidst their cares. Would love to commit to my journal some of the incidents they gave us, but time will not permit. Returned to the convention before the evening lecture by Mrs. Foster. I spent a pleasant hour with Dr. Houghton and wife and Dr. Pearson. Took tea at Dr. Cross's. Saturday afternoon, at the Young Men's Christian Association building, attended the industrial school that was started by three or four little girls. A great work has been done since. In the evening, a reception was given to the members of the convention at the residence of Mr. D. Ricketts. It was, to me, an unusually enjoyable occasion, especially in the opportunity afforded of meeting a score or more of the persons mentioned in Baca, many of whom I had not seen for several years, and introducing them to one another, several of them having never met before. This convention was more like a reunion of old friends than any I ever attended. They were from all directions, east and west. Early in the evening I learned a dear cousin, Fanny Woodward, lived in the city and was searching for me. After the reception I had a hearty welcome to their pleasant home. Sabbath went to the Meridian Street M.E. Church heard Rev. W. H. Boole of New York. Mr. Hanscom had arranged for Miss Smiley and me to dine with Mrs. Dr. Gauss, Mrs. Jones, and others from the East at the Occidental Hotel, so we would be near to the place of the mass temperance meeting in the afternoon. Mr. Grubb and Mr. MacDonald of Ohio were also in the company. By the courtesy of Mr. H., we were all taken to the Central Avenue M.E. Church, where, with Esther Pugh, we held an interesting meeting. After spending the night with an old friend, Mrs. Beard, returned next morning to the convention, which was held in Robert Park's M.E. Church. After dining with Cousin Fanny, we called on Mr. George W. Cobb in the interest of the railroad work took the train for Cousin Amos Fithian's at Knightstown, Indiana, where I had a very delightful visit until Wednesday morning. Left for home on the 6 a.m. train. Had a quiet day's rest. Last evening heard Mrs. Youngman's lecture on temperance. Today I was too late for the opening of the industrial school, but Mrs. Applegate gave me a good report of its work. Yet, in all such enterprises, the cry is coming for more laborers. Called on Mrs. Theobald, Miss M. C. Thompson, Dr. Hypes, Mr. Allen, and at Brother Schaefer's office. I shall enjoy Sabbath at home. Blessed place! But how I miss dear Fanny! London, Wednesday, November 12th. A hearty welcome by all back to my room, next dearest spot to home. 
returned Monday. I have since mailed over twenty-five letters and as many postals. Over one hundred should be written, but it is impossible and get my manuscript ready. Hope I shall have more rapid progress with my writing than heretofore. Brother K's are so very kind, they will not even let me build my own fire. Moody, Footy, and Finley are pleased when they can do a favor. Saturday, December 13, 1879. Half past six. Worship and breakfast over. How I enjoy these early hours! What shall I render unto the Lord for all his goodness? Day before yesterday, Brother K. butchered. When I went downstairs, he invited me out to see his nice lot of meat. Two large dressed hogs were apart from the rest. These, he said, are for a widow lady. I am going to ship them to Dayton. As I watched the boys taking them to the cars, and knew they would be so acceptable, I could imagine our dear mother's surprise, and how her heart will, like mine, overflow with gratitude to our father, who will reward these friends for their remarkable kindness. Having been writing so closely, I felt it was my duty to attend the missionary tea meeting at Mrs. Morgan's evening before last, had a social time. The young people managed it this month, and most successfully. I remained all night with Sister James. Saturday, Stella MacDonald came and took me to their home, six miles in the country, near Lafayette, where they had arranged for a meeting. It rained, and was so dark that to accommodate all, and please us who were afraid to go in the buggy, they went in the big wagon. I was surprised to find how comfortable we could be made with hay and robes. The ride was a real novelty. Had a well-filled house for such a night, and good attention. Today, Brother Jackson came out, also Miss Mary Warner. He read part of my manuscript. She will be of great assistance in copying it for me. I have promised to visit the public schools tomorrow. This will take a few hours of time, but I am sure it will be well spent. I never enter a schoolroom, but I long to impress the children with the importance of improving time and opportunity, and to encourage the teachers, on whom it is such responsibility, to feel how privileged they are to thus mold characters and make lasting impressions, for the teachers rank next to the parents in the unconscious influence exerted. Saturday, December 20th. Oh, how sacred the memory of this room and the associations of this home will be! Brother K is going to send Mother a Christmas turkey. The holiness meeting and reception here last night were blessed to our souls. The house was filled. A number, with Father Withrose, came over from Newport. Mrs. Reese of Steubenville, Ohio, and Reverend Mr. Carland of Indiana were here. Tomorrow will be my last Sabbath with this people. We always have a precious time in Brother K's class. On Tuesday morning, Reverend Mr. Crow, a Presbyterian minister of Pleasant Valley, Ohio, and Reverend P. C. were with us for our last family worship. Our parting hour had come. Goodbyes said. On my way home, I stopped over at Alpha, where arrangements were made for a meeting. A blind friend of other days, Miss Mary George, stayed with me all night at Dr. Crawford's. Was delighted to find Brother James at home. The pleasures of Christmas were increased by his presence and other company, with the cheering letters from dear Fanny and her husband, Mr. Howell, giving favorable news. January 1, 1880 in Columbus, Ohio, attending the local option temperance convention. Many of the leading temperance laborers of the state were in attendance. I dined at Brother William Hubbard's with President Merrick and others. Evening, in company with Mother Stewart, enjoyed the Railroad Young Men's Christian Association reception. Remained with her overnight at Brother Peters's, where we met old camp meeting friends. 
From here, filled an engagement at the Neal House with our state WCTU president, Mrs. Woodbridge, and secretary, Miss Nettie Moore. Met Judge T. and others of the committee. They have added their endorsement to my evangelistic railroad work. At the invitation of Rev. A. G. Byers, I visited the penitentiary. From the chaplain and warden, we learned nothing was more effectual than kindness with firmness. Sabbath attended a service at 8 a.m. in the blind asylum, 10 a.m. at the friends' meeting, and at 4 p.m. Brother W. A. Wagner's gospel meeting at the depot. I am rejoiced to meet such a company of railroad men and their families who are interested in the master's work. How our hearts beam to see a revival in this branch of work all over our land. Monday returned home. January 7, 1880. At the invitation of Mr. and Mrs. P. Smith of Dayton, I was privileged to visit the Western Female Seminary at Oxford, Ohio, conducted by Miss Helen Peabody and her efficient corps of teachers. My heart had been long drawn to this school, both because of its sending forth so many thoroughly trained Christian workers for home and foreign fields, and also from its being the home of one of the teachers, Miss Emily Jessup, with whom I had corresponded and feel deep sympathy, as for many years she has been similarly afflicted as I was. Her wheeled chair passing through the halls rendered the account of my restoration peculiarly effective upon those young minds. We have reason to believe the Lord blessed it to the salvation of precious souls. Over a week was most pleasantly and profitably spent with this interesting family. January 22nd. Business called me to Cincinnati. From the train I went to the Methodist Episcopal Book Concern, met a score of ministers, among others had a talk with Bishop I. W. Wiley, who had not met me on my feet before, went through the building to the different departments, longed to shake hands with every employee. So well I remember when in my helplessness it was a privilege to be able to pray for each of the hands, even those that made the paper, or had anything to do with making my books, or boxing and delivering them. How little I then thought I would ever visit Brother F. E. Jones's office, where my engraving on the cot was made, and have another for the sequel standing on my feet. From here I went home with Rev. J. Pearson to Mount Auburn M. E. Parsonage attended a series of meetings in his church where blessed associations were formed. On Sabbath, through Mr. P. Henkel, we enjoyed a visit to the Bethel Sabbath School, a sight excelling anything I have ever witnessed. Over 3,500 were present, several hundred being mothers with babes in their arms. Some walked two or three miles to this meeting. Some days after this, I was hurrying along on 4th Street when an aged woman tapped me on the shoulder, saying, "'Please stop, lady. Did you not talk to the mothers at the Bethel t'other Sunday?' As I answered, "'Yes,' she continued. "'God bless you. I knew twas you. I haven't forgot what you said, and have prayed for you every day since.' Her eyes glistened with tears as I gave her a tract with a kind word and passed on. I thought, how blessed it will be to be hailed in heaven and thus meet those who have brought blessings to us. What encouragement to be faithful in dropping a little word here and there for Jesus. Even a kind look will make its impression. Pleasant hours were also enjoyed in the home and church of Rev. G. R. Alden, Mrs. A. is better known as Pansy. I am greatly under obligation to them and Rev. J. Pearson for their aid in completing the copying of my manuscript. After spending a pleasant night with Mrs. Irvin House, whose husband's writings were a blessing to my soul years ago, I had the pleasure of visiting the school of Mr. Thane Miller, 
another privilege I never expected to enjoy when long before this I felt interested in his work. From there called on a dear invalid, where I gained more strength than I was able to give. Her sweet face of patient waiting and enduring helped me through all the day's labors. After a little visit with Mrs. Conklin, who bestowed a timely favor, I bade farewell to these dear friends and turned homeward, spending Sabbath at the seminary at Oxford. After several busy weeks at home, besides others, a visit was made to Troy, Ohio, where I had expected to go some time before, as the reader will remember. It was a pleasure to meet this people again. I only expected to remain one night, but the friends insisted upon having a meeting the next evening in the Presbyterian Church. Although my time was pressed, I had no liberty in turning away from this request. As I walked into that church, and stood where my couch sat when the surrender was made to be a more willing instrument in the Lord's hands, to go anywhere or do anything for Christ's sake, all the past came up vividly. Unutterable gratitude filled my heart for all the leadings of my Heavenly Father from that time to this. I was even carried farther back than my first visit to Troy, by the presence of my first pastor in Dayton, Rev. M. A. Richards. He opened the services of this meeting. I am reminded of the contrast between my condition on the evening when some friends called to unite their prayers with ours before starting to Lakeside in 1877, which resulted in my going to Philadelphia, and all that followed in the unexpected paths until the present time, March 22, 1880, when a little company gathered in to bid us Godspeed on my second trip to Philadelphia. Tuesday, in company with Mother, we started eastward, stopping on the way at several places. Friday evening arrived in Philadelphia, where a little company warmly welcomed us in the home of Sister Fanny. And now, at the close of this little volume, with a grateful heart, I desire to return thanks, first to our loving Father, who has brought me into the light and liberty of his precious love, and released me from the bondage of suffering and helplessness, and next, to each of the dear friends he has raised up, who, by their sympathy, by their material aid, and by their prayers, have encouraged and helped me on my way, until now I send forth this second record of the Lord's dealings, hoping and praying it may accomplish his purpose, who has so manifestly led and sustained me, and be a comfort to some suffering ones who are still called to remain in the furnace of affliction. I can fully sympathize with you, dear sufferer, and would that I could see all delivered, but I trust you will realize there is as much service in patiently suffering and waiting as in actively doing our Heavenly Father's will, resting assured, if it be His will, restoration will come. He knoweth what is best for us. This reminds me of the promise made on page 124. By request, a reference was made to a sermon in a letter from Rev. D. Steele, D.D., which is here inserted for the benefit of the reader. Salem, June 9, 1879. Miss Jenny Smith. Dear Sister in Christ, I have not forgotten you, but have often inquired respecting your welfare. I rejoiced when I heard that you were healed. Last spring I saw your pastor, Brother Leonard, who told me that you were walking about the streets of Dayton as well as anybody and praising the Lord. When at Mansfield Camp Meeting in 1877 I saw that you were misunderstood, and that some good people, whose zeal was in advance of their knowledge, were reproaching you with unbelief because you were not healed. So I took occasion in a sermon to speak of the difference between the grace of faith and the gift of faith somewhat as follows. 1. The grace of faith is required of every soul who has any knowledge of the object, Christ, and its absence in such souls is the ground of their condemnation. 
He that believeth not is condemned already. 2. The gift of faith is not required of any one, but is sovereignly bestowed by the Spirit, dividing to every one severally as he will. The scriptural ground for this distinction is found in 1 Corinthians 12, 4-31, especially in verse 9, where faith is enumerated as one of the charismata, or special gifts, and what is specially to be noted is that it is mentioned in connection with the gift of healing. 3. There is no more culpability for not having the gift of faith than there is for the lack of the gift of tongues or the gift of miracles. 4. The grace of faith is grounded on the general promises of the Bible, but the gift of faith is not grounded on any such promise, but on the conviction inwrought in the believer by the Holy Spirit that God will, through prayer, do some specific thing as convert a certain soul or heal a certain invalid. 5. The grace of faith is always accompanied by the condition, if it be thy will. The gift of faith is the assurance that it is God's will. Hence there is no if in this prayer. 6. The grace of faith is the permanent habit of a soul, as indispensable to spiritual life as breathing is to natural life. The gift of faith is occasional. St. Paul sometimes had it, Acts 28, 8, and sometimes he was destitute of it, 2 Timothy 4, 20. The gift of faith is not requisite to the highest spiritual life any more than the gift of tongues or the gift of healing. 7. Though blessed with the most rapturous visitations of the Comforter, and a cloudless communion with the Father and the Son, yet I have never been endowed with the gift of faith for my own or for another's healing. I write this as an invalid about to take a sea voyage in quest of health, a boon which I would gladly accept as an instantaneous gift if it was God's will. I am praying the Lord to heal me, with or without means, if it be his will. Ever since reading the chapter on Faith Cures in Dr. Bushnell's Nature and the Supernatural, I have believed that the gift of healing has been in the church in all ages. There is danger of fanaticism in treating of the Holy Spirit and his gifts. May the Lord Jesus keep you from all errors. Yours with the Abiding Comforter, Daniel Steele. Oh, that a blessing may rest upon each one who reads this book. We ask an interest in your prayers, trusting we shall meet beyond the river. But while sojourning here on earth, may we, as his humble followers, realize day by day what God is to his people. Footnote written on our visit to Bella Cooks, see page 240. Our fortress in life's war, secure, impregnable, forever sure. No foe can ever harm, God's faithful people sheltered here. He bids them not to doubt or fear, but trust in his strong arm. Our covert from life's fearful storms, our hiding place mid earth's alarms, our God to him we fly. To this strong tower we love to run, and when the victory is won, his name we magnify. Our counselor, our friend, our guide, his aid he never has denied to those who trust his grace. His loving kindness he will give to those who by his precepts live and love his name to praise. Our rock, the great fountain stone, on which we build, in him alone, our trusting souls confide. All human things are insecure, but this our rock, so firm and sure, will evermore abide. Our burden-bearer, loving word, we cast our burdens on the Lord, and joyously go free. Life's heavy loads we need not bear, he bids us cast on him our care, and says, I care for thee. Our light, O blessed, glorious one, in this dark world he is our sun, and his all-cheering rays, our saddening gloom and fear dispel, 
they make our souls with gladness swell and fill our hearts with praise our prophet teacher we would hear his blessed teachings and revere the precious words divine his statutes be our chief delight obedient blameless in his sight in his own light we shine our wisdom and our righteousness redeemed partakers of his grace in him we are complete he is our great atoning priest and through his sacrifice the least may find in heaven a seat our comforter in sore distress our fountain in the wilderness our bread of life from heaven we eat and drink abundantly the feast prepared so full and free to us our god has given our jesus savior for our sin poured out his life our souls to win a cleansing stream it flowed stupendous love that brought him down to wear for us a thorny crown and shed his precious blood redeemer of our captive race deliverer oh the matchless grace he came to set us free he opened our dark prison door and said go out and sin no more i've come to ransom thee refiner should our god prepare a furnace fire and place us there to glorify his name if thus he make us pure complete shall we not welcome furnace heat and triumph in the flame the great i am jehovah lord by all the hosts of heaven adored our own victorious king through him we all may victors be before his power our foes shall flee and we our triumph sing our father dearest sweetest name his goodness let our lips proclaim who deigns our names to own and calls us his through saving grace exalting us to share a place as joint heirs with his son by mary d james end of chapter twenty eight end of from baker to beulah by jenny smith